The difference between disgusting straw water and a delicious cup of coffee could be as simple as moving your kettle from here to here. It's insane how much you can change how your coffee tastes just by pouring a little differently. So today, I'll be breaking down seven different types of pours and how and when you can use them to craft the perfect cup of coffee for you. Oh, and we even shot some sick slow motion footage to show you just what goes on in the slurry. Okay, if you follow the work of the Coffee Science Foundation and stuff that scientists like Jonathan Garnier and Samo Smirke do, then you're probably aware that the physics and chemistry at play when brewing and extracting coffee are not for the faint of heart. So with this video, I wanted to take some of the things that I've learned from all of this research and my own experiments and observations to break down one of the most important aspects of pour over coffee, the pour. Okay, so what about the pour makes it so significant when it comes to brewing coffee? Well. In one word, agitation. Simply put, the way that the water hits the bed dictates how much it disrupts or agitates the grounds. The more agitation, the higher the extraction. Unfortunately, the simplicity ends here. So let's dive deep into the fascinating world of falling water to try and make some sense of it. A massive thanks to Quick Brown Fox Coffee Roasters for sending us a bunch of coffee that we use for most of the testing in this video. If you're in India and you're looking for some delicious coffee, definitely check them out. The link is in the description below. Now, before we get into it, I'd like you to keep this general rule of thumb in mind. More agitation equals more extraction equals more fines migration equals higher chance of clogging and stalling. Also, remember that coffee has various flavor compounds that can extract at different rates. So two brews of the same coffee at the exact same extraction can taste very different depending on how they were brewed. So let's look at all the ways in which you can control the balance of these flavor compounds to craft the perfect cup just by manipulating the pour. First, let's look at the hardware. Okay, so this shouldn't come as a surprise, but the kettle is kind of important since you can't really do much pouring without one. And the type of kettle you have dictates how much control you have over the pour. You could brew an amazing cup with a regular kettle, but try and repeat that and the odds of success are about the same as someone who's quit their day job to become a full-time YouTuber. Having a large spot at the top just makes it very hard to control flow. But that being said, there are some nifty hacks to brew stellar cups without a gooseneck, so stick around for that. Okay, so the frustrating truth is that not all goosenecks are made equal. The weight of the kettle, the body shape, handle position, how much water is in it, the shape, length and diameter of the spout, and your mood all dictate how the water flows out of it. Don't worry, you don't need a $200 kettle to brew great coffee. What I'm trying to say is that you need to learn how to control your kettle, like real men control their emotions. The increase and decrease in flow with say the Hario Bono is much more dramatic than with the Stag. Every time I switch kettles, I end up doing a 20 second pour in like three seconds and brew a tasty cup of straw water. Like with anything else, practice pouring at a steady rate and with time, your brews will get significantly better. If you have scales like the Luna that can track flow, then a great exercise is to try and maintain a steady flow rate at around one mils per second and work your way up all the way to eight. You can do this with regular scales too, it just involves a little bit more math. Pay close attention to how each step feels and over time, you'll get really good at doing this without scales. I know, this all sounds so extra, but isn't that precisely why you clicked on this video? I mean, if you're happy with your brews, seriously, just shut this video off and go live your life. If, however, you have this insatiable need to constantly try and make your brews better, or you're thinking of competing, then Learning how to control your pores will change your life. Fine, that was a tad dramatic. Anyway, let's move on. Okay, so first let's kick things off with pore parameters before looking at the different kinds of pores. These are basically the variables that you can control to manipulate your pores. After racking my brains on how best to demonstrate this, we ended up shooting washed beach sand in slow motion. And while these particles are heavier than coffee, they don't color the water, allowing you to see exactly what's going on way more clearly. Cool, so first up we have pour height or spout proximity, and this one is fascinating. If you've read Jonathan Garnier's book, The Physics of Filter Coffee, which I highly recommend by the way, then you're familiar with this. The height from which you pour dictates how much agitation is happening to the grounds. Pouring low and fast causes a smooth lamina flow, which can dig a hole in the bed and potentially cause channeling. Also, smooth flow is a lot less effective at breaking apart the coffee particles and agitating them. Pour from too high and you have a ton of bubbles being created which have buoyancy and are very ineffective at disturbing and agitating the bed as you can see here. 
they barely tickle the surface. So how do you find this sweet spot of agitation? Well, as you raise your kettle higher and away from the coffee bed, you achieve deeper and more efficient agitation. And this keeps increasing until you get to the point where the stream of water coming out of your kettle breaks up into smaller droplets. This is called the breakup length and varies from kettle to kettle. The higher the breakup length, the higher you can hold your kettle and the more deeply you can agitate. Basically, pouring from a height just below the breakup point will allow you to create the most agitation. But as you'll see later on in this video, you don't always want that. And as you just saw, once you've raised the kettle beyond this breaking point, air bubbles are introduced and the amount of agitation starts to drop again. And if this wasn't enough information to make you sell all your gear and go to a cafe, then hear this. The breakup length changes with flow rate or speed at which water exits the spout. And this is the second variable but I'll get to that in a second. The breakup length also reduces as water temperature increases. And once you're at boiling, then all hell breaks loose and you get a spluttering mess. So if you're brewing something very light and your recipe calls for deep agitation, then just stay a couple of degrees below boiling to keep your kettle from misbehaving. So yeah, that's pour height and you now know how it affects your coffee bed. Next up, we have speed or flow rate. This is basically how quickly water exits the spout and is controlled by how much you tilt the kettle. Here again, the design of the kettle determines how fast or slow you can pour with it. For example, the stag has what is called a flow restrictor and is capable of very controlled, very slow pours, but isn't really capable of very fast flow rates. The Bono, on the other hand, has unrestricted flow and a larger diameter spout, allowing for very high flow rates. While it is capable of slower pours too, it is harder to control as small changes in tilt cause pretty big changes in flow. Now, I mentioned that the flow rate affects the breakup length. So to achieve the desired agitation, you need to find that sweet spot combo of pour height and flow rate. The next variable is the number of pours. So say you're brewing 15 grams of coffee with 250 grams of water, then you can either pour all of this water at once or split it up into two or more pours. Things get super interesting when you use different types of pours in the same recipe. And we'll talk about that in the next segment, but now back to the number of pours. So fewer pours means you have a taller water column above the coffee bed and therefore have an overall higher brew temperature due to the added thermal mass. But this also means less agitation. I'll explain why in a second. Now, as you increase the number of pours, you have less water above the coffee bed, which means you lose heat quicker. But on the flip side, you also increase agitation because the kettle stream has less water to penetrate before it hits the coffee bed. As you can see, with a steady pour, the agitation keeps reducing as the height of the water column increases. There is one side effect of pulse or multiple pours, and that's fines migration. So while you're getting higher extractions, you're also more likely to have issues with stalling. So as you'll have noticed by now, finding that perfect balance for a given coffee is sort of the theme when it comes to mastering the art of pouring. And the last variable is frequency or rate of motion. Okay, this name may sound confusing, but it's basically how rapidly you're moving the kettle when you're doing a non-static pour. For example, if you're pouring in circles, then how quickly are you drawing these circles? Here, the faster you move, the quicker you wet the entire bed the kind of bedwetting you can be proud of as an adult. Now, this movement can reduce the breakup length if done too aggressively, and also the velocity that a vertical stream of water carries will reduce when a sideways force is applied to it. So again, moving the kettle too quickly will reduce agitation, and this may or may not be what you want. So far, so easy, right? Okay, so those are the parameters, and now that you know what they are and what they do, you can use them very intentionally. But before we look at some examples, we need to first look at the different types of pores. This is by no means exhaustive, but we've broken them down into seven types. And with all of these pores, you can change one or more parameters that we just discussed to manipulate the impact of the pore on the resulting bruise. Okay, so first up, we have the circle pore. This is by far the most common type of pore where you start at the center and spiral outwards, kind of like my life is right now. Then work your way back in and repeat until you hit your target weight. I mean, there's a reason why this is so common because most brewers are circular in shape. So it just makes sense to pour this way in order to get all of the coffee wet evenly. And most of the time, that's exactly what you want. Circle pours cause the most agitation overall and help achieve higher extractions. Next up, we have the center pour where you hold the kettle stream steadily in the middle of the bed. Here, you're intentionally agitating just one part of the bed and this can help speed up the brew time and also shift the cup balance to be more acidic. It also reduces the TDS. Then we have the off center. 
This one's interesting and is mainly used when you want to do a very fast pour, but the high flow rate is causing the stream of water to exit your kettle at an angle. Now, how pronounced this angle is depends on your kettle, but basically in order to compensate for this, you pour slightly below center so that you're still agitating the center of the bed as the stream penetrates the water at an angle. Next, we have the sideways pour. Okay, so this type of pour comes from a meticulous Japanese brewing technique called osmotic flow. It's an ultra low agitation pouring technique that is used to brew dark roasts at lower ratios and achieve very balanced brews. I find this style fascinating, but I haven't had the time to really get into it and study it more deeply. If it's something you'd like us to make a video on, then let me know in the comments below. I just wanted to mention it here as with this technique, you tilt the kettle sideways and pour, which helps one achieve very low agitation by getting very close to the bed which is something you might find useful even for regular brewing. Just make sure your kettle isn't too full because this requires quite a heavy tilt. The next one I've been obsessed with and that's obstructed pours. Okay, so this is just a name for any pour that is obstructed in some way to change the way the water stream hits the bed of coffee. This is something that could be done with say the mellow drip or other drip assist devices or simply just breaking the stream with a spoon, which is a technique we developed for times when you don't have a gooseneck kettle or when you're brewing with a brewer like Sophie, where you want to prevent the stream from digging a hole in the bed. There are several scenarios where flow control like this can be super useful, and they also unlock a lot more options for how you can brew the same coffee. For example, if you use the Mellow Drip, you can grind as fine as you do for a mocha pot and brew with the Aurea with negotiated filters and still achieve a total brew time of under three minutes to get a delicious high extraction cup that's still lively and vibrant. That's near impossible to do with a direct unobstructed pour as agitating will dramatically slow down the brew and mute acidity, increase bitterness and introduce astringency. The next one I like to call the bob. You may have seen baristas at cafes bobbing their kettle up and down when pouring and just like the kettle, I keep bobbing back and forth on whether I should recommend this or not because I've had very mixed results. It requires a lot of skill to maintain the same motion, making it very hard to replicate across brews. So Barista Hustle posted an article about this. They called it the yo-yo pour. I think my name is better. But they mentioned that their average TDS was similar when brewing with a bob and fixed height pours. But in my testing, I consistently got lower TDS with the bob. I also got quicker drawdowns and a different cup profile that worked for some coffees and didn't work for others. So if you're brewing at home, then play around with it. It's fun. If, however, you're training baristas, then I'd steer clear because it's very hit or miss. And last and least, we have the paper pour. Pouring directly on the paper dramatically slows down the brew time. And here's why I think this could be happening. Firstly, the rapid flow of water bypassing the coffee and running between the walls of the brewer and the paper cause a bit of a vacuum and slow down the brew. The other one that I think has a much bigger impact is that the fines are all being pushed down to the bottom section of the filter and clogging it. When brewing regularly by pouring water onto the grounds, you kick up a lot of these fines that can be seen settling on the sides of the brewer further up the walls. So with these fines now spread across a larger surface area, as opposed to being concentrated just at the base, it has a much smaller impact on the flow rate of water through the paper. These brews also don't taste very good as the fines get over extracted, mute the acidity and increase bitterness and astringency. So I would avoid pouring directly on the paper entirely if possible. Okay, I know I said seven types of pours, but I've heard mentions of a zigzag pour, but haven't had the time to test it. It just feels like a square peg in a round hole considering most brewers are circular in shape. But if any of you have tried it, then I'd love to know how you got on in the comments below. Okay, that was a lot of information and I highly recommend going back and rewatching the theory if you're new to brewing. I'm not just saying that to get more views. But now, let's look at how we can put this into practical use. But before we do that, I have poured my heart and soul into this video. So a like and sub to the channel would be amazing. Okay, in front of me, I have three cups of coffee with the exact same recipe of 15 grams of coffee and 250 grams of water. 15 gram bloom, 100 gram pour at 45 seconds and another 100 gram pour at 1 minute 35 seconds. And the only thing that's changed is the pouring structure. The first cup has all circular pours. The second cup has a center pour for the last pour only. The last cup has a circular pour for the bloom only followed by two center pours. You should try this at home. It's amazing how you can shift the balance of a cup just by pouring a little differently. Cup one has the highest TDS and is sweet and balanced with a lot of body and intensity of flavor. 
It has a more mellow and subtle acidity and a little bit of astringency creeps in as the cup cools. If I were to serve this at a cafe, I'd be pretty happy. Cup number two, you immediately notice an increase in acidity. It's a more vibrant cup, but still sweet and balanced, but a little less intense and a little less body. Again, very enjoyable. Cup three has the lowest TDS at 1.25, and there's a big shift in this cup, and it's much more tea-like and acid forward. You sacrifice a little bit on the sweetness and body, but gain so much more in terms of character and complexity on the acidity side. If you're into that, like me, then this is probably the cup you reach for. It does fall off a little quicker in the finish, so I'd probably split the first pour into a combo circle followed by center pour just to dial it in a little more. This blows my mind every single time. It's like using an equalizer to tailor the sound. Knowing how to pour allows me to create the taste profile that's best suited to my palate without changing anything else. Nuts. Anyway, let's quickly run through a couple of interesting examples of how you can use these techniques to troubleshoot and tweak your brews. Okay, so say your cup lacks vibrancy and the acidity is too muted, but everything else is quite enjoyable. Then you most likely had a very long brew time and that tends to dull the acidity. If you have an overly acidic coffee, then you can use this technique to your advantage, but in this case, you likely wanna try and get a quicker drawdown. So how do you achieve this by just changing up the pores? Well, the easiest one would be to introduce a little more center pour in your recipe. This will speed up the brew time and kick up the acidity a notch. If this is throwing your cup off balance, then be a little less aggressive with the center pour. Still not quite there, then try sticking to circle pours, but just lower the pour height or flow rate and see if the lower agitation helps give you the desired results. You now have all of the tools and you know what they do, so you can be a lot more intentional with the changes you're making to get to that Goldilocks zone a lot quicker. Okay, one more example. You have a dense, washed Ethiopian coffee. These are notoriously slow as they tend to produce a lot of fines. Grinding coarser gives you sour, under-extracted cups, and you're still dealing with pretty long brew times. Grinding finer stalls the brews, muting acidity and kicking up the bitterness and astringency. In these situations, it's good to try and use faster filter papers, but if that's not an option, then lower agitation and obstructed pores are your friend. Grind a lot finer and use higher temperatures, bloom with a controlled direct pour, and then switch to say the mellow drip for the next two or more pours, depending on how your brew is draining. The finer grinds and higher temperatures will help achieve good extractions without the need for too much agitation from the kettle stream. This means reduced fines migration and lower chances of stalling. I could honestly go on and on with more examples, but I think you get the point. And this video is already way longer than I thought it would be when I started working on it. But if there's a scenario you're finding particularly challenging, then drop it in the comments below and I'll be more than happy to help you troubleshoot. Yeah, so brewing is basically like solving a puzzle with multiple outcomes, some desirable and others not so much. And wrapping your head around pouring and the immense impact that it has on the cup will change the way that you play this game. And with that, I'm exhausted. But I really hope this helps you make better coffee or at least gives you something new to obsess over and tinker with. If you made it this far, then post a comment below saying, I'm so poured. So I know who my people are and I can thank you for being just as crazy about coffee as I am. And as always, thank you so much for watching and pour quickly or aramse, depending on what your brew needs.